I want to talk to you about how drones like this are already changing the way that we tell stories. There has already been an Academy Award given for filming a Hollywood movie with one of these. Extreme sports athletes are using them all the time to film the crazy stuff that they do. And speaking of extreme sports, wedding photographers are actually offering these as a service. <laughs> you, can, you too can have your wedding photographed from a flying robot. But those are all happy stories. I'm interested in, can this be used to tell an unhappy story, a sad story, a gut-wrenching story? I'm a journalist. And I think journalism, when done right, shines a light into the darkest corners of our communities. It tells us things that we maybe don't want to know about, but we need to know about so that we can take action. And I think journalists are going to use these someday. They're going to teach us about how bad the storm was. They're going to teach us about how our communities are developing. They're going to teach us about the environmental consequences of our decisions. But I'm afraid that we aren't thinking this through all the way. Because journalists tell some pretty bad stories, some pretty terrible stories from our communities. To understand my worry, you have to understand the noise. You have to hear it. You have to have it in your head. And I want you to have it in your head for the rest of the time. I'm going to try to not drop this. That would be embarrassing. This is a DJI Phantom 2. Weighs about five pounds. It plays a pleasant little song when you turn it on. But for about 800 bucks, you get the airframe. You have to hear that noise. Pretty clear it's not going to sneak up on anyone. <laughs> Makes a little bit of sound. And the blinky lights kind of give it away, too. All right, you got that sound in your head? <laughs> I'll be honest with you, when my students and I started looking into how we could use this to cover news, we were really caught up in the cool factor because let's just admit right now, that's pretty cool. <laughs> You're talking about a flying robot with cameras here. I mean, my inner 14-year-old boy is just like, yes! <laughs> but the more you're around that sound, and the more you listen to it, the more it kind of gets into your, your head, really gets into your soul. And you realize there's no escaping it. And the more you're around it and the more people around it, the more you realize it affects people differently. It affects situations differently. And that's where the seat of my worry is, is how it affects situations. I'll give you an example. A former student of mine, Ben Kramer, has traveled the world with these devices, shooting video, shooting documentaries. And he was in a massive wildlife preserve in Africa, in Kenya, and had been photographing wildlife all day. And he noticed how the animals behaved differently around it. Giraffes, oh, they were downright curious. They'd walk right up to it. Like, he actually had to pull back from them. They were so curious. Could fly right eyeball height to a giraffe. The gibbons up in the trees weren't really bothered by it. They just kind of hooted at it. Like, what is that? Rhinos could have cared less. They could not be bothered. Elephants, elephants took off running. As soon as they heard that noise, they were gone. They were out. That was unfortunate because Ben was there to get video of elephants. <laughs> the biologist that he was with hatched a plant. It was the dry season, and there was a spring nearby that provided regular and reliable water for the animals. So they went over there, and they camped out. And sure enough, along comes a small group of elephants. Ben takes off, and he could actually fly right up close to those. They didn't run away. But Ben noticed something. Their body language was different. And what their body language said to Ben was, I want to run away, but the only water around here is right there. And I can't leave until I have a drink. 
so I'm going to stand here. And his own internal code of ethics said, nope, that's not okay. I'm affecting the situation. I'm affecting that animal. I'm going to land. The biologist insisted he wasn't doing them any harm, but he said, nope, I'm done. I can't do this. And he landed. It was the noise. It was the noise that was causing the problem. And that noise is inescapable. And I'm afraid of what it might do in the wrong situation. I was remembering a story that I covered when I covered law enforcement a long time ago in Little Rock, Arkansas. I remember a murder case that I went out to. I was driving over to a police department. A call went out to a murder. And it was just a few blocks from where I was at that moment. I made a hard turn over, and I got over there, and I got there before the first responding officers got there. And I got out of my truck, and I looked down, and in the yard were three boys. Their father had gotten high on PCP and beat them to death with a rock. Two twin 18-month-old eighteen boys and their three-year-old brother. Since he was high, he thought he was Jesus coming to save us all. So he took his boys, and he laid them very meticulously out in the shape of a cross in the yard. And I can see their faces right now. I can see those boys in my mind's eye. I do occasionally wake up from dreams even now. This is 15 years ago. And I looked down at them, and I noticed how they were laid out. And the next thing I perceived, I understood, was a sound to you that I will describe only as pain. And it was these boys' mother who was in the front yard, on her knees, wailing. And my, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps right now because I can hear that sound. And for some reason, I was thinking about that case a couple months ago. And I was thinking, what if, what if then was now? And I was still a reporter, and I had that drum. Would I use it in that situation? And I thought about it, and I was like, well, no. But maybe. What, a, what would I do? Well, I thought, well, the first thing I'd do is I'd wait until the police covered up the bodies. The second thing I'd do is I'd go back a block, and I might just get up above the tree line, real low, real inconspicuous, and I might get a shot from far back that just laid out the scene and showed those boys on the ground to inform people, to show people just how awful this crime was. But I thought about that. And I thought, well, if I have one, then everybody has one. All the TV stations, all the radio stations, all the gadflies, all the freelancers, you name it. Instead of one, we've got 15. And it doesn't take a great leap of imagination to realize they're all competitive. So if one scoots forward, the next one scoots forward. And then it just keeps going on. And before you know it, there's 15 drones over the head of that mother. And she's being robbed of her right to mourn in that moment. There's not a person in here right now who will look at me and go, great idea. There's nobody in here right now who's going to go, you know what, that's an awesome use of journalism. Because it's not. It's horrific. And I wish I could tell you that I had a solution to this. But I don't. The FAA right now makes it very, very difficult to research these issues for a whole host of reasons I could do probably about 10 TED Talks on. But we are careening towards a day where regulations will be in place that will allow this to happen. We're going to have rules that tell us what we can and can't do. What we don't have are ethical principles that tell us what we should and shouldn't do. And I talk to my students all the time about that. Because we can, should we? I think we need a set of drone ethics that says what we should and shouldn't do, when we should get them out, when we shouldn't, how close is close. We need a set of ethics that understands that noise affects the situation. I want drones that inform our communities, that shine that light in those dark places. I don't want drones that leave scars behind. Thank you.